Yeah, but we'll see how it goes. We'll explore a few ideas um, together regarding ghosts. So the reason that I came onto it is because I was learning a Gemara Masechta Marcus um, Daf uh, Daf Hay, and the Gemara there speaks about somebody um, who um, um, Rav Yehuda. Um, I'll show it to you. One second. Right. Um, Rav Yehuda ben Taboy. The Gemara says um, that Rav Yehuda ben Taboy. He was a very great rabbi. Um, and he says, So there's an interesting, we know that at the time of the temple, there was something called a tzedukim. Now, I think a lot of people have heard of the tzedukim. Um, they followed somebody called Tzodok. And this Tzodok did not believe in the oral teachings of the Torah. So we have our body of wisdom called the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Medrashim, and the Tzodokim, they, these followers of Tzodok, they did not believe in the oral law, and therefore they had different understandings of how to fulfill the mitzvahs, and <clears throat> they were often great um, enemies of, um, of uh, the orthodox traditional world. In English, they call them Sadducees. You know why they call them Sadducees? Because they're very sad, you see? So, um, but, uh, but they are called the Tzedukim, Tzedukim, and they only followed the, uh, the written teachings of the law. So there was a particular case where they had an understanding which was not the, the way that our sages had a tradition that it should be. And so the Gemara tells us Rabbi Yehuda um, uh, ben Taboy, he deliberately killed uh, one of these um, uh, false witnesses um, in, in order to show that the rabbinic way uh, was the correct way. And this was the way that we were following. And it was, um, this person was a, um, a false witness and this person had tried to get somebody uh, killed. And the law is that if you're a false witness and you try to get somebody killed and then you're found to be lying and that really you were somewhere else um, at that time. So it says that they do to the false witnesses as he had intended to do. So there's a big discussion. In the end, he had this false witness killed, but there's another detail, which is that you can never just um, find one false witness guilty. It's a package deal. If they're both found guilty, that is when there's a death penalty. And if only one is found guilty, then there's no death penalty. So here Yehuda ben Taboy had been so careful. Here is a real life false witness. The law should be applied to him in the traditional way. So therefore we should kill him, which is against the way that the Sadducees had understood it. But he made a mistake. And the mistake that he made was that you want, you want, he wasn't really entitled to kill this individual because really one should only, um, he would only be entitled to kill him if both him and his other witness were found to be false. So that is the background of this Gomorrah Masech um, that I have been learning. Um, so um, Omar Le Shimon Ben Shotach, I'm just sharing this on the screen now. So Shimon Ben Shotach said to him, he made an oath. He said, you've, you've spilled innocent blood. He says, you made a big mistake over here because these false witnesses, you can't kill them unless you find that both of them are lying. And here, it was only a single one. Now, the, the early commentaries, the Rishonim, the Ritva, they say probably this false witness that Yehuda ben Taboy executed, probably he was guilty for other things as well. Because surely if the great uh, Rabbi Yehuda ben Taboy had him killed, presumably he had other things that he was guilty of, which were deserving of the death penalty. But nevertheless, Yehuda ben Taboy, when he heard that he had make this, made this error over here, so the Gemara tells us, Miat kibralov Rabbi Yehuda ben Taboy. So Rabbi Yehuda ben Taboy accepted upon himself immediately a penalty. That he will no longer issue any 
halachic rulings, and they, unless they are in front of the great rabbi Shimon ben Shotach, who had shown him the error of his ways and, the, and had shown him how he had made a mistake, he said, from now on, I'm not going to paskin anymore. I'm not going to rule anymore. And it's, I'm just going to, I'm only going to paskin in front of Shimon ben Shotach, lest I err again. Okay, what else did this uh, rabbi do? That every day uh, or his whole life, he would go and, and to the grave of this false witness who was killed, who shouldn't have been killed because of this detail in the law. And he would cry there and he would pour out his heart um, uh, out of uh, asking for forgiveness for having killed him um, when, according to the strict letter of the law, he shouldn't have been killed. For Haya Kaile Nishma, and his voice was heard out. So people thought, you know, they see Yehuda ben Taboy going to the grave of this false witness, and they hear wailing and they hear crying. And everybody thought, hey, you know what this crying is? It's the ghosts of the dead witness. Omar, Rehuda ben Taboy said, no, you're making a mistake. It's not the, vo the voice of the dead witness. Kaili shalihu, teidu lomachahumais en kaili nishma. He said, no, 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 it's my voice. I'm the one who is doing all of the crying and wailing over here because I'm so sorry that I had this witness killed, even though he was a false witness. According to the letter of the law, he, he, he shouldn't have been killed. So it's me who's crying. And you know what? I'll give you a proof. The proof is he knew that his days were numbered. And you heard the Ben Taboy said tomorrow that I'm going to die. And you'll see that from then on, you won't hear this voice anymore. So it proves that it's my voice. It proves it's the voice of me, this living person. You heard the Ben Taboy, you'll see that tomorrow I'm going to die. You won't hear the voice anymore. That's what he said. Now, is this a good proof? Omer of Acha Bred the Rova, Rav Ashi, Rav Acha, the son of Rova, said to Rav Ashi, that's not a good proof. Dilma Bedina Kombade, Inami Piyuse Piyuse. This is not a, a good proof because it's possible that it really was the voice of the ghost of the dead witness. Really, maybe it was him. Aye, so in that case, so why is it going to stop crying and wailing when Yehuda ben Taboy dies? Because now he's got nothing to wail about anymore because he has brought Yehuda ben Taboy to justice in the heavenly court or because Yehuda ben Taboy has appeased him, has got him to um, forgive him. So Yehuda ben Taboy tried to bring a proof it's me who's crying and screaming. <clears throat> and um, Ravina and, and Rav Acha, the son of Rava, said, listen, we believe you that it's you, but your proofs are no proofs. Because it could be that it was really the voice of the ghost of the witness. It's just that he'll stop crying after you die. So you see from over here, the Gemara accepts as a very, very normal thing that it's possible that it could have been the ghost of the dead witness who was crying out. Now, we find actually a number of cases in the Gomorrah where um, there are um, such things um, and where people are able um, to come back even after they um, have died. Um, I'm bringing now, sharing on the screen from a wonderful website called RabbiUlman.com. RabbiUlman.com has a study where, where he goes through different um, uh, matters of the Neshama. And one of the things he has here is on ghosts and apparitions. So he brings a Gemara in Masech the Ksubus 103a. And we find other cases in the Gemara where somebody is allowed to come back. Our rabbis taught when Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi, now who is Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi? He was the person who put together all of the Mishnayas. When he was about to depart from this life, he said, I want the presence of my sons. When the sons came, he instructed them, Take care that you show due respect to your mother. That was the first thing that he wanted them to know. He had a life full of Torah and mitzvahs. The first thing he was concerned about is look after your mother. The light shall continue to burn in its usual place. The table shall be laid in its usual place. And my bed shall also be spread in its usual place. What's the reason? Because after his death, the great Rabbi Yehuda Anossi used to pop back down he used to come back down to this world. He used to come home um, as Shabbos came in every Friday night. He used to come home. On a certain Friday night, a neighbor came to the door speaking loudly. 
The maid whispered, don't make such a noise because the great Rabbi Yehuda Anossi is sitting there. As soon as he heard this, he didn't come anymore in order not to slight the honor of the earlier sages who were not permitted to appear. So what do we see from this, um, uh, from this uh, 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 Gomorrah? We see that Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi, he was allowed to come back um, after he had died. What is death? Death is when the soul leaves the body, the neshama leaves the guf. And Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi was allowed to come back down into this world. And it seems to be that this was a special merit that he had. In fact, we know about Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi that despite the fact that he was very, very wealthy, he said, I never took pleasure for my own sake in this world. Everything I did was l'shem shomayim for the sake of heaven. So all of the things, the pleasures, the physical delights I had in this world, they were not actually with intent, just as an end point. They were with intent to serve Hashem um, by eating this, but to serve Hashem by wearing this or by experiencing this and to appreciate Hashem and everything that I do. For a person like that, even when he dies, his, um, uh, his, his neshoma, even when he was in his body, he wasn't so connected to his body. He led a spiritual existence. So therefore, even when he died, he was allowed to come back as though he hadn't died. He would make Kiddush Friday night and, um, and even the maid was able to see it. Yet when he heard that other people got to find out that that's what he was doing, he stopped doing it because he said, if I do it, it doesn't look nice for all of the other great rabbis of the previous generations who were not allowed uh, to come back down uh, into this world. So um, that's why he stopped doing it. But we see that it's possible that again, that just because someone has left their body, um, uh, and in these unusual circumstances, he's allowed to come back down. Sefer Hasidim explains that he'd come back home and he'd wear the same clothing, his special Shabbos clothing, and he'd make Kiddush. And he was unlike other dead that are free from mitzvahs, meaning that they don't do mitzvahs anymore because tzaddikim are still considered alive and, they, and he was still able to be mitzi other people. He could make Kiddush on their behalf. Why? Because he still kept on growing after he had died. Now, the next ghost story is one of the famous ghost stories in Chazal, in the writings of our great rabbis. It is not in the Gemara, but it is in Kala Rabosi. It is in a Medrash. And I'd like to learn this with you. And it's a very powerful Medrash. And um, it mentions a number of things. And after um, I finish this, we'll discuss all of the things that we can learn from this Medrash. Rabbi Akiva, Nofaklahu Asa, Rabbi Akiva, he went out to a certain place. Ashkechelahu uh, Gavra, he found a certain person. Dahavadori Tuna Akasfe, who was carrying a big load, a load on his shoulders. He was having a very, very hard time walking with it. And this person was screaming and groaning. So he said to him, what have you done? What have you done? He knew immediately that this man must have done something. He said there wasn't a single sin I didn't transgress when I was alive. He had a life that was full of Aveira. And now there are special spiritual watchmen. And they don't let me rest. You see, normally a person goes to, if they've done mitzvahs, then they go to Gan Eden. And if they do Averis, then they go to Gehenna. But there are certain reasons why a person won't even be allowed into Gehenna. And this person had done so many Averis, they wouldn't even, they said, you want to come to Gehenna? Who do you think we have down here? People like you? No way. You're much too bad for Gehenna. So he wasn't even allowed in um, to start repenting for his deeds and experiencing the cleansing procedure um, uh, uh, of Gehenna. So Amalai Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva said, Shavak de Barat, did you leave a son behind? Amalai um, um, Bachayech, so he said like an expression of a shvua, of an oath. Lo, 
Sashin, the Dachilna Mimalache, the Mochali Bapulsa, the Nura, the Omerli Amai, Lotesi Bapiria. So, um, so he said, by your life, don't delay me by your questions because I'm in dread of these angels that hit me with rays of fire. And they say to me, why don't you go faster? Um, I, it's a good thing that we're giving this shit in England. It's still the morning because this is, a, I don't want to disturb anybody's sleep from learning such a medrash. But it's still the morning time. There's a lot of other stuff to do today. But that's what he said. Very, very scary Gomorrah. So Rabbi Akiva still pressed him. He could have just gone away. But he didn't. He still pressed him. Um, 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 it's right. Um, so, um, so he uh, asked him, Omale, Emoli, tell me, my the what did you leave behind? Omale, Shavkis Itzom Abarato. When I died, I left a pregnant wife, a pregnant woman. It doesn't even say uh, a wife. It's, it says translated here as wife. Itzom means a woman, a pregnant woman. Also, Rabbi Akiva, all lahim So Rabbi Akiva, again, he didn't just walk away. He went to that Medina um, where um, where he where he was. Um, so to to the place where that person used to live. Omar lehu, and he said to the people there, braid the plane, hey Do you know where the son is of such and such a person who he had met? So the people, that his local people said, let his name be blotted out. Of that person, um, let his bones be crushed. So Rikiva said, what do you all have against this fellow? Why do you say that his name should be blotted out and his bones should be crushed? They said to him, list him, ha'hu, list him, ochal inchi, omatsa'er, uh, uh, so this guy, he had quite a lot of crimes that he had com- um, committed. They said he was a listim. Listim means a highway robber. It says, which is like he destroyed people, like he ate them up. Um, and he distressed everybody. He distressed the populace. Um, right? He just used to distress everybody. And not only that, but he had illicit relations with a betrothed girl on Yom Kippur. So this girl was betrothed to somebody else. And Nara Hamurosa, we know that the Jewish marriage ceremony has two parts. It has Kiddushin and Nisuin. Kiddushin is the first part, where after they have Kiddushin, she is no longer able to have relations with anybody else, to marry anybody else. And then there's Nisuin. Um, after she was a Nara Hamurosa, there was this girl, she was already engaged, she was forbidden to any other person, and he had illicit relations with her. Not only that, it was on Yom Kippur, when we were all sitting in shul, and we were all singing, and we were all davening, this fellow was having illicit relations with the betrothed girl um, on Yom Kippur. So may his name be blotted out and his bones crushed. Oza Levese, so Rabbi Akiva didn't give up. He had so many opportunities just to let it go, but he didn't give up. He went to the person's house, Ashkach itse mu'ubarato, notra ad diyalda ozal male. So he, um, he, Rabbi Akiva went there and he, he went to this house and there was this uh, woman there who was pregnant. So he didn't go back to where he lived. He didn't give up at that point. He stayed there until she gave birth. We don't know what month of pregnancy she was in. Um, and um, he circumcised the son, um, as it says over here, Ozal Male, he went and he did Mila on the son. Lechi Godal, when the child grew up a little bit, Oik Mebe Bekanishta, Levruche Bakalo, that he, he, um, what, he set him up in the shul, um, at Levruche Bakalo, to, to bless in the congregation, meaning to daven for the Omud, right? That he, he was praying, Levruche Bakalo, means really to say Boruchu, right? Um, which is what we say when uh, we bring the minion together. Boruchu es Hashem HaMavayach. Let us all acknowledge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the source of all blessing. And everybody says, yes, Boruch Hashem, um, Boruch Hashem HaMavayach Le'elon Void. Blessed is Hashem, the source of all blessing forever and ever. And then the person, the Chazan, he then repeats because he wasn't included the first time they said it. So he then repeats, Baruch Hashem HaMavayach Le'elon Void. So Rabbi Kiva sets him up 
to daven for the Omads to be to lead the community to say Boruchu and to do the blessings and to lead the services. That's what Rabbi Kiva did. And then he left. That was all we are told. That was so he must have uh, waited until he's old enough that he was able to actually lead some to, to say Boruchu. And sometime later, Rabbi Akiva went to the place where he'd seen this original ghost, and Ischazile, and he appeared to him. Um, Omar Le, and the apparition that the ghost told him, May your mind be put at ease, because you've put my mind at ease. This is a source. Um, Kalarabosi is a source for saying Kaddish and for um, uh, somebody leading the services that we see that if a person um, uh, has somebody afterwards who says Kaddish and leads the services um, uh, on their behalf, so then that brings a great deal of spiritual benefit to the deceased person. And um, here, in this case, it is another ghost story. It's a ghost story. Uh, it's a ghost story that... Um, that where, where, we, where we see clearly that this man, who was a big Rosha, even he, he wasn't even let into Gehenna, he was so bad. This was like the really, really bad guys. Yeah, he wasn't even let into Gehenna, but still Hashem gave him the opportunity that things would work out. It's a, an amazing kindness of Hashem, that Hashem gave him that opportunity. It's an amazing kindness of Rabbi Akiva as well that he didn't give up. Not only when he first saw this ghost, um, he said, you know, what's, what's your story? The ghost says, look, I've got no time to speak to you. They're busy chasing me with like beams of light, you know. I've got no time to speak to you. So Rabbi Akiva persevered and he said, no, tell me, you know, tell me, tell me your story. Um, so, um, so he said, then Rabbi Akiva said, did you leave a son? Um, and Rabbi Kiva said, uh, when he heard that she, it was a pregnant woman, he didn't know anything else um, about it, but he went to the place where that person lived. Um, and everybody said, he's such a Rosha that, you know, we don't want anything to do with him. And he still persevered. And, um, and even after they cursed him and they said, Ya Kerizichro, let his name be blotted out, let his bones be crushed. And still, Rabbi Akiva could have said, yeah, you're right, what a rush shot. And he didn't. He found the pregnant woman. He could have walked away then because she was only pregnant. He didn't. <clears throat> he was a very busy rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, you know. Um, oh, in his earlier days, he had 24,000 students. In the later times, he had five. Um, and, and more later, we needed to teach Kala Teira Kula, the whole Teira to. But still, he felt it was a worthwhile thing to stay with her and to wait until she had a baby, and then to do the bris mila, and then to take him to shul, and then to ensure that he would be able to lead the services. And this caused, this caused that this person who was in such great spiritual pain, um, that he was able um, to be put uh, at ease. So, um, so here you have this um, story where, which shows us <laughs> the importance of doing things for the elevation of, of the soul of somebody. Like I know uh, that these shiurim um, that were put together, if I am correct, um, or are le'ilu nishmas, correct? Yeah, the, these shiurim are nishmas, Mrs. Jacob, zichreinu levracha. Yes, correct. Um, and so this is a very, very um, a great service to the neshama, Yishukayach. And, um, and, and this is a sort one Sorry of the stories. Pardon? Sorry for speaking. Oh, Bartia. Um, Bartia. And this is one of the great um, sources um, for such a thing. Now, you may think that, um, okay, you know, that's all very well and good uh, if uh, somebody has somebody um, in order to say Kaddish for them, but not everybody does have somebody in order to say Kaddish for them. So what happens there? So the answer is that even if it's not the person themselves, even if they themselves don't have <clears throat> any um, offspring who are, <clears throat> who are saying Kaddish, but there is still another way um, of doing this. And there's an amazing, amazing story 
uh, which I want to uh, share with you. Um, I know the story from the descendants of the people who are involved, but I want to, because um, it's a story uh, regarding the great rabbi, Rav Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld, um, who many people will have heard of. He was the great Rav of Yerushalayim. And I want to share with you a story. He had a granddaughter who lived in Golders Green um, called uh, Eti, Sechreina Levracha. Um, her last name just escapes me momentarily. Maybe I'll remember it later. And, um, and I would like to share with you a, a, a ghost story um, relating to someone who didn't have anybody, any children at the time to say Kaddish. So forgive me if I read this story inside. It's just such a great story. A friend, I told it over in a shia, and um, people told me that it's actually uh, written up um, the details over here. Pressburg was one of the most important cities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Its yeshiva was one of the largest and most respected in all of Europe. In the mid-1800s, there lived a wealthy merchant who had a large store in the center of the city. He was well-respected and active in the Jewish community and also known for his generosity. One charitable custom of his was remarkable. Each day he would count the proceeds of his business, calculate how much was profit, and from that separate 10% for Masa, um, for the poor, um, as like a tithe, which he would deliver daily to the yeshiva. Tragically, this outstanding man suddenly took ill and passed away at a relatively early age, leaving behind a widow and five young daughters. His wife was a clever and energetic woman who had always helped her husband in the business and knew it well. After his death, she took it over and maintained its prosperity. She was also careful to continue in her late husband's generous ways. And each day she would deliver Ma'aser, a tenth, from the prophets to the Rosh Yeshiva. Who was the Rosh Yeshiva? He was the illustrious Kasav Saifa. Um, and um, the Kasav Saifa was the son of the Chassam Saifa. This was in Pressburg. Um, and I was there um, a few months ago and uh, we went to the graves um, of uh, these great tzaddikim. So here we have the deceased man and his wife used to um, follow on in his tradition and give some money um, each time to the Rosh Hashiva, to the Ksav Saifa. Now, when her husband died, she had daughters, she didn't have any sons. So she asked the Rosh Hashiva to arrange for Talmidei Chachomim to say Kaddish for her husband for the entire 11 months and also each successive year on the yacht site. And she also requested that a second Kaddish be said each day, having in mind all those souls who have no one saying Kaddish for them. So that was a very, very great act of generosity and righteousness that she said, please say a set, one Kaddish for my husband, but another one for anyone who doesn't have anyone to say Kaddish for them. This went on for nearly 10 years. Sometimes the mass would be as much as hundreds of krona a day, but however much it was, she would always inquire to make sure the yeshiva was keeping its side of the bargain. But then the wheel turned. Instead of daily profits, there began to be losses. Even so, the widow maintained her schedule of appearing daily at the yeshiva, except she would inform the Rosh Hashiva that today, unfortunately, she had nothing to give. But still, she would persist to ask if they were saying Kaddishes, even though she was no longer able to contribute financial support. And they would assure her that, of course, they were, and she should not worry. Day after day, her situation got progressively worse until finally she had to start selling some of her jewelry and other valuables in order to put food on the table for her daughters. No one was aware of her deteriorating situation except for the senior students and staff of the yeshiva who knew that her business was virtually bankrupt. One day, a matchmaker, a shadchan, came to her house and after some pleasantry said, my dear lady, your daughters have all matured nicely and grown quite pretty. Perhaps because of your extensive involvement in the business, you haven't noticed that it's time for them to get married. I'm confident I can find many outstanding yeshiva students that will be interested in them for you to choose from. Just tell me how much dowry you are willing to provide for each one. She wisely decided not to admit her true situation to him and instead merely said that she would think it over and get back to him about his offer. He left and she burst into tears. Afterwards, she dressed and hurried to the yeshiva. She poured out her misery to the Rosh Yeshiva, sobbing. She said, I just don't understand why my situation deteriorated so. Again, she asked if the Kaddishes were still being said, and he comforted her that they were.
Now hold on to your hold on to your chairs. Hold on to your chairs at this point. Suddenly the door opened. A distinguished looking older man entered, turned to the widow and asked why she was crying. He told her that he knew of her desperate situation and he was prepared to help. He then requested of the Rosh Hashiva that they all go into his office and the two and that two scholars of the yeshiva join them. The Rosh Hashiva acceded and summoned two of his five great disciples present that year, his son, Rabbi Shimon Sofa and Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld. Now, as I mentioned, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld, the Rav of Yerushalayim, I know a number of his descendants, maybe you do as well. And we have here in, in my shul, Nishmas Yisrael, some of his descendants. Um, and um, and uh, I knew his granddaughter and I verified this story with her. When they were all assembled, the mysterious guest in the Rosh Hashiva's office said, I know you have five daughters of marriageable age. Let's figure each one needs a thousand krona for dowry money, another thousand krona each for the expenses of the wedding, for buying furniture and setting up a household. So that's 2,000 for each of the five, 10,000 altogether. Plus to put your business back on its feet, you need another 10,000 krona. So that makes 20,000 altogether. All right, then he said, I'll write you a check. Whereupon he took a checkbook out of his pocket. He tore off a check. He wrote the woman's name on it and inscribed it for 20,000 krona and signed it. Before handing it to her, however, he asked the two young scholars, Rabbi Shimon Sofa, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld, to sign on the back as witnesses to the transaction. You know, a 20,000 krona back in those days, fuwa, a large amount of money. He didn't want anybody questioning this check. So he um, made sure that there were witnesses and not just any witnesses, two of these very esteemed uh, uh, disciples of his in the yeshiva. Okay. Um, he also asked them to take out their personal notebooks so he could sign in each of them a sample of his signature in case the signature on the check would be challenged. Turning back to the woman, he told her that she should present the check at the government bank when it opened at nine o'clock and they would honor it. Then he left as suddenly as he had come. All present were shocked, still in disbelief. It was as if they were sharing a dream. Then one of the young rabbis jumped up. A man like that could really help the yeshiva, he said excitedly. <laughs> <laughs> that is the way a good yeshiva bocha thinks um, that such a person could help the yeshiva too let's go ask him the two ran out and searched they couldn't find him or anyone who had seen him at nine the next morning the widow was at the bank the guard at the door directed her to one of the tellers to whom she showed the check he looked up the records and told her there was sufficient funds in the account to cover the check but for such a huge sum he has to first get permission from the bank manager. He asked her to wait and went to the administrative section. Then he presented the check to the head of the bank who took one look at it and fainted. Pandemonium broke loose. People were running this way and that. The police came after questioning a few employees, confined the astonished businesswoman in a security room, locked the door pending further investigation. The doctor was summoned quickly, revived the bank manager. As soon as he gained consciousness, the bank manager asked that the woman who had brought the check be shown into him. When told she had been locked up by security, he said he must go to her. A great mistake has been made to lock up such a righteous woman. He went quickly and after apologizing, invited her to accompany her into his office. Tell me, please, he opened after they were seated. How did you get this check? She told him of her difficulties and the sudden appearance of her unknown benefactor. She explained about her deceased husband and his practice of daily ma'aser, of giving a tenth to support the Torah scholars. And of the Kaddishes she had arranged through the yeshiva for him and for the souls who had no one to say Kaddish for them. He asked her, if you would see this benefactor again or his picture, would you recognize him? She said, yes. She added that two rabbis from the yeshiva were official witnesses to the whole episode and that their signatures are on the back of the check and that the man had also signed in their personal notebooks. The manager was excited to hear this and after looking at their signatures, contacted the yeshiva to ask that Rabbi Zonenfeld and Rabbi Shimon Sofa come to his office. They came and confirmed all the woman had said. The bank manager then told the three of them that he would personally order the check. 
as it was drawn on his own family account, but that his wife had to endorse it too. He then sent for his wife with a message she should come quickly because people were waiting for her. But first she should collect all the family photographs in the house and bring them with her. Although the bank manager was a Jew, his wife was not. When she arrived, he asked the widow and the two rabbis to wait in a different room. He told his wife what was going on and said, let's see if the woman can identify the man who signed the check from among these photographs. She declared that if all turned out to be true, she would convert to be Jewish. The manager then spread out the photos on his desk. He asked each of the three to enter separately and see if the man who gave the check appeared in any of them. Each one confidently picked out the same person. The bank manager called everyone in. Do you know who this man who gave the check is? He asked, it's my father, the manager of the bank before me. But he has been dead for 10 years. I must confess, he told them, that I never said Kaddish for him. Last night, he appeared to me in a dream. He said he'd been saved from Gehenna by the Kaddishes that she had arranged for the yeshiva scholars to say for those souls for whom Kaddish was not being said. And now that she was in difficulty, we must help her. He said he would give her a check for 20,000 krona. And if I don't pay it, he would strangle me in my sleep. Scary, scary business. I woke up frightened. In the morning, I told my wife the dream. She was disturbed too. When the check was shown to me at the bank, I fainted. I knew then that the dream was true. I will pay 20,000, uh, my father promised, for it is certainly a deserving cause. Not only that, he added, turning to the woman, I'll add another 20,000 of my own because you fulfilled my obligation for me and you helped my deceased father's soul with the Kaddish saying that you had arranged. He addressed the three of them. I fully regret my lapse from Judaism. I see now that our God is the one true God and he gives to all their just rewards. I resolve that from now on I will fulfill his commandments was revealed in our Torah and my wife too has reaffirmed her promise to convert and to live in accordance with the Jewish law. Please guide us to understand what we have to do. He instructed the teller to give the woman 40,000 krona. The first thing she did <laughs> was to give 10% to the yeshiva. And soon thereafter, her business waxed prosperous again. Her five daughters made good marriages with God-fearing young Torah scholars. Um, and that is translated and retold from Eitzah Maisius in the name of Rabbi Y. Shapira, who heard it from Rabbi Zonenfeld himself. And as I say, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld um, lived from, 90, from 1848 to 1932. Um, and the one from whom we know this story, he studied at Presburg Yeshiva from 1865 to 1869. He was a major Torah sage of the Ashkenazi community in the old city of Jerusalem for nearly 60 years. And its official leader after the death of Rav Shmuel Salant in 1909. He had many children and his youngest child had a youngest child. And that was the one who I knew um, who um, she and, and she herself was in charge. Uh, one of the people in charge of the sage nursing home um, in the Golders Green. And she only passed away this year. And I heard the story from her. And as I say, this is a story well known in the Zonenfeld family and written here with all of the details. Now, if Rav Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld was one of these fluffy rabbis who was always telling stories, eh, you know, you take it with a pinch of salt. But he was a great halachist. He was a great paisak. He was a very, very great Torah scholar. And his whole life was not about telling stories. His whole life was about the MS of the Torah. And that makes this story all the more powerful. Um, so we see over here that there are um, uh, a few things. Number one, this man in the story, the father of the bank manager, he was able to come back down out of her Satoiv, out of gratitude to this lady and to help this lady out in the time of her distress. She had been so good to his neshama for all of those years. And he was able to come back down to help her at her time when she needed to look after um, her own family. Um, we also see that, um, that even if we saw before the Medrash with Rabbi Akiva, where it was his own son who had said Kaddish, we see from this story that even if it's not one's own child um, who is saying Kaddish, in this case, it was the Yeshiva Bochrim who was saying Kaddish for any Neshomas that had no one to say Kaddish for them. 
Um, and um, we see that that too is very, very powerful for the neshama um, of a person. I suppose we could ask, if that is indeed the case, then why did Rabbi Akiva work so hard to educate this child that the child of this um, uh, highway robber, this bandit, should say Kaddish himself? Surely Rabbi Akiva himself could have just said Kaddish for this soul. And he was the, the God al Hadayr. Surely that would have been very powerful. Seemingly, it gives Hinachta Esdati, seemingly, it gives a greater manuchas hanefesh to the soul of the deceased if it's his own descendant who is the one who is saying the uh, doing the davening right levruchi lekohol um it seems as though it gives greater um uh, nachas ruach uh, it gives greater serenity and peace of mind um to the soul of the departed if it is one of their descendants as it says over here tanuach uh, datcho the, the, this uh, highway robber says to Rabbi Akiva, the dead highway robber, the ghost of the highway robber, he says to Rabbi Akiva, your soul should be put at rest because you put my mind and my soul um, at rest. So um, you see over here, it seems that Rabbi Akiva realized there would be even greater nachas um, ruach, even greater serenity and peace of mind for this departed person if it is um, the uh, his own uh, offspring who would be saying Kaddish, and that's even more powerful. Yet we see from this other story with the Reis Chaim Zonenfeld that even if it's not one's own offspring, that's also a very, very powerful um, thing. You know, uh, it, because of this coronavirus um, lately, there have been many, many people for whom there was nobody saying Kaddish for. Um, but you see that, um, that things can still be fixed even afterwards. Kaddish can be said even afterwards, even if it's not at the exact uh, right time. It is, uh, especially on the yacht site, any time throughout that first year, um, uh, throughout the first 11 months especially, uh, is a very auspicious time um, to say Kaddish. And also there were actually people who were still saying Kaddish. There were some minyonim that never stopped uh, throughout the last few weeks. There's a very precious minion in South Africa, uh, just outside Johannesburg, there's a nursing home there where the men were all living in the nursing home and you had the minion in the nursing home. And these people were saving everybody else and were bringing great brocha down to the world because they were all there in their nursing home um, and they had the minion and they were making sure to say Kaddish for all of those who had nobody to say Kaddish for them. It's the same in Heslia, it's a Dutch old parents' home. And they advertise, or they make, uh, we, uh, if, if you want to say Kaddish, you can tell them, and there was a minion here in Holland. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Tremendous. Tremendous. A big, big zuchus. Yeah. And, I, and I also know um, of a yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael where they had all become religious. All the boy, it was the yeshiva for Baalei Tshuva, for people who'd become religious. They could not go home because their families were not observant and it was very difficult for them. So all of these boys, they all um, um, uh, quarantined together in the yeshiva and they still had minyonim up and going. And they were saying Kaddish for many, many people um, as well. So we see um, on the one hand from this uh, discussion today, and with this we'll close, if it's okay with you, we'll close now. Um, but, um, but we see um, how the neshama still lives on afterwards. And if we see it from this story in Echo Rabosi, this story with Rabbi Akiva, Kala Rabosi, excuse me. Uh, if we see this story with Rabbi Akiva, um, how impacted a person is um, after they pass away. With the punishments, we know HaKadosh Baruch Hu's attributes of kindness, Merubah, uh, uh, um, um, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu's attribute of kindness is all the more so that people who led their lives full of Torah mitzvahs for sure how much reward they must be getting in Elam Haba and we also see how we can do things for the Neshama of another person and that gives them even more Yishuv Hadas Menuchas HaNefesh Tanuach Dat it gives them even more um, peace of mind in Shomayim when people down here are doing mitzvahs and dedicating it um, to them, that it should be for the Aliyah, for their Neshama. Fantastic if it's family members, but even not family members. And we also see it like the ghost of this bank manager that they were allowed, that just, just occasionally, 
they're allowed to come back. Unfortunately, or fortunately for them, not often, not often, but just occasionally we can get a glimpse. Um, but, uh, but certainly that would be a very, very rare situations for them to come back. But we do believe um, that there is such a thing. Um, okay. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn with you. And we wish you lots of Hatzlacha and Siyat HaDishmayu, all the Neshama should have an Aliyah. Um, and um, we wish everybody they should be um, gesund. I'm just uh, going to type my um, um, email address over here. I see that somebody wanted to be in contact. It's Rabbi Tugentaft at gmail.com. Uh, and if anybody uh, would like to be in contact, please uh, do by all means. I wish you had Salach and Siyad Adishmaya. Everybody should stay safe, be gesund, be gebenched, and every bracha of Hashem. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And well over the fast. Amen. Thank you. And to you too. Kalte. Okay. Hold on. You well. Kalte. Kalte. Goed gedaan, Paul. Ah, ja? ja, ik ben het. Ja, ja het nee, hij is goed spreken. Wat? Hij, hij is getrouwd met uh, Kimge, ja? Ja, ja, ik weet. Ik weet. Uh, hij was vroeger in Bornwood. Ja, ja, ja. Hij ja, ja. is geweest in Valuation in Bornwood. En, en, en Danny kent hem. En toen heeft ja. hij gezegd, vraag hem een keertje. Nou, ah, is het okay. tweede keer. Hm? Ja, dat is, het is een... Uh...